First prize is a chance to live. Second prize, you really don't want to hear what the second prize is, so please don't disappoint us. We've all paid to see a show, we've all given up our free time, so if you refuse to fight, it's gonna be really boring, and I'm gonna end up having to jump in there and kill you both. You have come here from all over the world because society has no further use for you. The international prison system has given up all hopes of your rehabilitation. This place will now be your holding pen until your death. I want to see prisoner 2675. You have since escaped from two level five maximum security prisons. DNA scan reveals a near pathological aversion to authority and a temperament prone to violent behavior. I run a multinational business here, Mr. Robbins. Basically, I take human garbage from around the world and I reprocess it. I'm very good at this business because I make all the rules. You will have no future contact with the outside world. Was there anything you wanted to add? To never turn your back on me again. There is no chance of reprieve here. No possibility of escape. You are condemned. Either accept it die. Welcome to Vacation Paradise. Enjoy. I could use a man like you. A position on my staff, perhaps. We appear to have an opening. And what if I say no? That would be very disappointing. Transmission from the island, code 7. Prisoner 2675 is alive. He's at the insider's camp. What is this place? Sanctuary, Mr. Robbins. We've created a new society here, a civilized one. We are totally alone on this island. We live under constant threat from the outsiders. You have proven yourself a highly resourceful man. We'd like you to join us. I'm not a joiner anymore. All I want to do is get off this island. Now I'm gonna kill you. Late April of 1994, No Escape hit the big screen in the USA and arrived two months later in the UK, produced for a modest budget of just $20 million and directed by Martin Campbell. The film sadly didn't perform well at the box office, pulling in $15 million. Its numbers for worldwide profits haven't been published, but the general consensus is that it flopped and didn't make much of an impact when it came to rent on VHS and was soon forgotten about. At the time, the reviews were mixed. Siskel and Ebert disagreed on its qualities. Surprisingly, Gene Siskel praised the film and its action, comparing its level of excitement to the Mad Max series. But Roger Ebert felt the society on the island wasn't well explained, and everything in the movie he had seen before. There was a video game released to tie in with the film, which will be discussed later. Over the years, No Escape hasn't been treated well on the home video format, with subpar transfers from old Laserdiscs, and has been out of print for a long time, but thankfully it did turn up on Blu-ray in Germany and Australia. The film today has been regarded as an underrated action movie, and is now considered a cult classic, but also made the director Martin Campbell a familiar name of the action genre, as he revitalised the James Bond series with Goldeneye and Casino Royale. Producer Galan Hurd was well known for her producing roles on The Terminator, Aliens and The Abyss, and gained the rights to Richard Hurley's 1987 book, The Penal Colony. The film would be loosely based on the book, which had the British government running a prison island for convicts from the mainland. New arrivals are dumped on the island by helicopters and must learn to survive, and are under the watchful eye of satellites tracking their every move. The script went through three major drafts before it was offered to director Martin Campbell. Martin had started his career directing TV dramas for the BBC, such as the highly regarded Edge of Darkness. He had made the jump to feature films with Criminal Law, Defenceless and the HBO TV movie Cast a Deadly Spell, which Galan Hurd had produced and she felt Martin was perfect to handle the penal colony, but the director wasn't initially interested. The script he was handed was too violent and lacked the right tone but he would take the job if he could make changes to boost a level of action and adventure. 
During the early stages of pre-production, the finances were hoping to cast an action star. With the $20 million budget, Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone were out of the question, so someone felt Jean-Claude Van Damme would be right for the part. He was sent the script but turned it down in favour of Time Cop. With Van Damme saying no, this pleased Martin Campbell and producer Galen Hurd, as they both felt the lead shouldn't be someone who was a familiar face of the action genre. They wanted an actor who wasn't an established action star, but someone who had done dramatic roles but could be moulded into a believable action lead. For the cast we have Ray Liotta as John Robbins. Ray had made a strong impact on film critics for his performance in Goodfellas and Field of Dreams. Ray was unsure about starring in an action movie. He needed reassuring that this was a good career move. Ray on set didn't really mingle with the other cast members between shooting which some resented. They found Ray distant and cold, but some cast members understood Ray's attitude as they knew he was focusing on his character and taking the part seriously. Ray's character is a former soldier who is suffering from PTSD and throughout his time on the island he gets flashbacks to the innocent people he killed due to his commanding officer's orders. We have Michael Lerner playing as the warden who runs the prison. Michael a familiar face of TV and film and often gets cast as a businessman or politician. He popped up in Barton Fink, Roland Emmerich's Godzilla and X-Men Days of Future Past to name just a few. The great British actor Stuart Wilson stars as Merrick, the leader of the Outsiders. He has in his possession a powerful weapon which is stolen by Robbins. Merrick wants it back to retain dominance on the island. Stuart has been acting on TV since the late 60s and has appeared in dozens of familiar movies such as Lethal Weapon 3, The Mask of Zorro and Hot Fuzz. I first saw him in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3, again playing a great villain, but in a utter turkey of a movie. I always felt Stuart looked a lot like Rick Mail, or was it just me? Lance Henriksen, who was no stranger to action films such as Aliens and Hard Target, stars as the father, the leader of the Insiders. The father is a well-skilled surgeon who was sent to prison for killing his wife, but the others on the island feel he is innocent. His wife cheated on him and was later discovered dead, after which the father argued she committed suicide. The always reliable Ernie Hudson stars as Hawkins, the head of security. Ernie took the part to enjoy the great weather of Australia and brought his family along with him, but wasn't expecting the supposed dry season to be pouring down with rain. Kevin Dillon, who many may recognise as the star of the remake of The Blob and the TV show Entourage stars as Casey. He was sent to prison due to being involved in a kidnapping. Many feel, including Robbins, that Casey doesn't belong there and should be set free. Casey idolises Robbins and desperately wants to be his friend, but his enthusiasm to help Robbins escape comes at a cost. Kevin J. O'Connor, which I'm sure many will recognise as Benny from The Mummy, stars as Stefano, who is in charge of dealing with the workers who find scraps near the sea. The late Don Henderson stars as Killian, who specialises in making homebrew. Don was a star of many popular British TV shows. You will certainly recognise him from Star Wars as one of the commanding officers. One of his last roles was appearing in Series 7 of Red Dwarf as a simulant. Theatrically trained actor Ian McNeese stars as King, who is obsessed with being clean to avoid any germs as there is no medicine on the island, but also he is untrustworthy as John Robbins later discovers. Ian had worked with Martin Campbell before on Edge of Darkness. Ian has appeared in dozens of films and TV shows such as Ace Ventura When Nature Calls and the TV series Rome. And last but not least we have Jack Shepard who like Ian worked in theatre plays as Dysart. He is the inventor on the island who was set there for making a powerful bomb for money which resulted in the death of 50 people. He thinks he doesn't deserve to escape and wants to be punished for his crimes. Shooting started in May of 1993 in North Queensland and New South Wales in Australia. The shoot lasted for 75 days. The production hired a lot of local craftsmen to help construct the insider's village and they also became extras in the film. It was supposed to be the dry season but it rained almost every day causing all sorts of problems for the crew who grew tired of the muddy locations and damp conditions. Some of the cast were unfamiliar with Martin Campbell's style of direction which mainly consisted of shouting and swearing loudly, not directly at the actors in attempts to be rude, but Martin had a short temper. Lance Henriksen didn't take kindly to Martin's attitude. He spent the majority of the shoot taking a disliking to Martin, but thankfully he and the director worked things out and found it all very funny by the end. The film's title went through a number of changes, first starting out as the penal colony, then to Escape from Absalom, then to Absalom 2022, and they finally settled on No Escape. Escape from Absalom was still used in most countries around the world.
In the future of 2022, prisons are now in the control of corporations and prisoners are now seen as assets and nothing more. John Robbins has been transferred to this new prison after murdering his commanding officer. The warden has extra eyes on Robbins due to him having escaped from two level 5 maximum security prisons. This new prison is a level 6. A fellow prisoner tells Robbins about Absalom, an island where they send the worst prisoners to fight to the death and is feared more than the prison itself. The warden, after being held at gunpoint by Robbins as he refused to kill his cellmate for storing food, is convinced that he is a threat and exiles him to the island. Robbins is dumped on the island and is quickly captured by a group of prisoners known as the Outsiders led by Walter Marek. The Outsiders live at an abandoned island resort which they have established as their base. Merrick forces Robbins to fight one of his men and is impressed when Robbins kills his opponent instantly. He offers him a position in the gang. Instead, Robbins escapes and steals Merrick's prized rocket launcher and manages to quickly flee the outsider's camp and traps. He is pursued through the jungle and cornered at the edge of a cliff before being shot in the neck by blowgun darts. After falling into the river below, he is soon discovered by the insiders. The insiders are led by a doctor called the Father. This community has laws to abide by to maintain order as opposed to the tyranny of the outsiders. Robbins meets father and the rest of the team. Robbins learns that the insiders are heavily outnumbered by the outsiders and that he is the only person to have ever escaped from Merrick's camp. Robbins now has to think of a way off the island, even under the watchful eye of the warden, who has armed helicopters ready to attack. No Escape has a variety of visual effects techniques with miniatures, blue screen, matte paintings and digital compositing. The majority of the work was handled by Robert and Dennis Skotax company Forward Productions, with some additional work by the computer film company. The Skotax had worked on Escape from New York, Aliens, The Abyss, Terminator 2, Batman Returns and their more recent efforts can be seen on Starship Troopers 3 and Harbinger Down. The majority of their effects work takes place in the first act of the prison, with the prisoners' arrival by train to the complex. These sequences have held up very well, with no wobbly matte lines or faded optical work. The design of this feature very much reminds me of Judge Dredd that came out a year later. The Skotax made use of a new compositing system by Quantel called the Domino, which was first used on the film Stargate. The Domino allows for near film resolution digital compositing. It allowed you to manipulate and adjust the mats and touch up visual effects. Quantel's Domino takes images which had been shot on 35mm film and converts them into video format by breaking each of the 24 frames per second into a mosaic of 3000 by 2000 picture points. Domino could also store two minutes of motion at a time, held on a bank of magnetic hard disks. This system helped with the nightmare sequence, where Robbins has flashbacks to the horrors of his past, the digital computer readouts and additional explosive flame effects which we see littered throughout the action sequences which look very 90s, they appear very 2D in their execution. Overall I think the visual effects have stood up well, it doesn't focus that much on it, there are only a small number of sequences that deploy optical effects and miniatures as most of it takes place within camera, so mainly relying on practical effects, thus allowing the visual effects artists to really fine tune the effects heavy sequences to look their best. The score to No Escape was handled by composer Graham Ravel, who was knocking out scores throughout the 90s to many cult favourites such as The Crow, Hard Target, Street Fighter, Strange Days and From Dust Till Dawn to name just a few from his large catalogue of work. No Escape has a strange score as it has many different styles of music at play. There is classical orchestral pieces, tribal drums, there is a mix of blues similar to his work on Hard Target and electronic compositions that serve the film well. I think Graham's other work stands out better. It's certainly not a bad score and has its moments, but there wasn't an overall theme to it to make it a consistent score to give the film a sort of musical voice. The score did come out on CD in 1994 with 19 tracks of music, totaling just nearly 40 minutes of music. Certainly not a complete score by any means and has been out of print for years, but is available on iTunes if you are interested in grabbing hold of the score. As mentioned earlier, a video game was produced a tie-in with the film, handled by British programmers Bit Studios and distributed by Sony ImageSoft and Psygnosis. Bit Studios also worked on the last action hero game for the Sega Mega Drive and Super Nintendo, so you can guess the level of quality to expect from this video game. No Escape on both consoles was panned upon release by magazines such as GameFan and Edge, 
the latter awarding it 1 out of 5. The opening sequence of the game nicely detailed the plot of the movie, but as soon as you get to the title sequence, there are no options available. As soon as you press start, you are being chased by the outsiders and it becomes a frustrating mess, with clunky controls, poor hit detection, making it really tough to time your jumps, and music that will drive you bonkers. Once you escape from the outsiders, you meet the insiders with whom you can trade items with to create weapons and tools to aid you with your escape from the island. It's definitely not as bad as the last action hero released a year before, but is still a massive turd. I would have been gutted if I spent £40 on this back in the 90s, but honestly, I never saw it in the shops. So, lucky me. I discovered No Escape round a friend's house who had recorded it off Sky Movies in the mid 90s. I never saw any trailers or posters for it during my visits to the cinema, so it completely went under my radar. My memories of seeing it round my friends was that it was a pretty good film, and it had one of the most epic explosions in a movie, and that was my lasting impression of it. I had tried to get it on Laserdisc come the early 2000s, but with it being published and produced by Sony, the US version had laser rot, so it was virtually unplayable, so I gave up trying to find a decent copy of the movie. Luckily, a fan of mine kindly sent me the Blu-ray, and I finally got a chance to watch it again, and in a decent resolution. The idea of No Escape is certainly nothing new. The ideas of criminals being sent to an island has been explored before, especially with John Carpenter's Escape from New York. The idea of a prisoner breaking free from a prison or being thrown into a cell for crimes they didn't commit is a genre in itself. There are so many prison dramas that all revolve around escape or false imprisonment. It's just a tried and trusted idea that seems to work with every new movie dealing with the subject, with my favourites being Escape from Alcatraz and The Shawshank Redemption. The idea of prisons being run by corporations for profit expanded heavily in the 80s, especially in the United States, and in this film it's pushed globally as big business has taken over. The film plays on the idea that because the prison is privately owned, they can do what they want with these people and they have no human rights. And this goes to the extreme with the warden using this island for his own personal entertainment. But we don't really see him enjoying this experience. He just watches the screens and satellite feed obsessively. It's clear he doesn't want the whereabouts and what's happening on the island to be leaked to the public. But it would have been interesting to see him revel in seeing them fight or having the prison itself have traps he can activate to keep up the threat. The action sci-fi film Fortress starring Christopher Lambert dealt with a similar subject two years earlier. When No Escape was reviewed, comparisons were made, but No Escape does change up its narrative to not just be a carbon copy of Fortress or any other prison-themed movie. Strangely, there were moments where I wanted to see more of the future world that's depicted in the opening act, but then it would just follow a similar path to Fortress, I would imagine. If one had the opportunity to choose, be in this fortress-like prison for the rest of your life or live on this island, I would choose the island. It seems less of a punishment because you're not confined to a cell. The island is your cell. You get fresh air and you can do what you want for the most part. You can do some gardening, weave some baskets, drink some homebrew. You just have to avoid the outsiders and make sure you take care of yourself. The film plays on the idea that the island is the next level of punishment but it doesn't impose that much more of a threat than being in a regular prison. You still run the risk of being attacked and probably suffer more mentally by being caged up for the rest of your life. But I suppose the biggest threat the island has is that it's situated miles away from everywhere else. So you can't swim to freedom, you are constantly watched. So the idea of a skilled military expert like Robbins, who has escaped from other prisons before, this island is going to be a massive challenge for him. So that is the film's main selling point and it works for the most part. As we move away from the high-tech opening act, we are shown the primitive way of living. This is where the Mad Max costumes come into play, especially with the outsiders. The insiders are basically a bunch of hippies. So you have these two radical different attitudes to how they want to live on the island, and both sides are aware they are being used to fight for the warden's entertainment, but they also seem to forget they are there for the horrible crimes they have committed. Some are there for minor crimes and rightly deserve to escape, but the film wants you to care about these convicts, especially the insiders. Most successful prison dramas do manage to make the audience care for the criminals. The story clearly divides the good and the bad, so you root for Robbins to save the day, so to speak. Like most movies like this, it plays on the idea that people make mistakes. They learn to be better people and often are thrown away for years for something they never committed as well. John Robbins is remorseful for his crimes, but has a good reason for killing his commanding officer and wants to escape to get revenge on the warden and let the world know of this island and what it's used for, creating an interesting story arc for him. 
It was certainly interesting to see Ray Liotta play as the lead in an action movie. He has the look of an action hero and does alright in the fight scenes. He's no Van Damme or Stallone, but I think this is also a blessing in disguise, as he fights in a more realistic, down and dirty way. He definitely comes off as quite intimidating and is very cold in his performance, so we the audience don't really know what's going on in his head until we see him crack due to his depression, but his character certainly becomes more sympathetic to the insider's cause in wanting to break from the shackles of the warden's sick attempts for them to fight to the death. Stuart Wilson as Merrick is a fantastic villain. He is over the top with his performance, but also has moments where he is playing it for laughs, and he is a genuine threat as he eventually kills all the other leaders of the opposing gangs of the outsiders to maintain control. His character feels like he is starved of intelligent conversation, as he is surrounded by loads of idiots and crazy people. He takes a liking to John very early on, but they don't see eye to eye. This causes Merrick to bring the outsiders together to finally get rid of the father and his followers, making for some really entertaining scenes as Merrick, Robbins and the father come face to face. No Escape is a solid action film with a great cast. You can't go wrong with Ray Liotta, Stuart Wilson, Ernie Hudson and Lance Henriksen. What a great mix! It tries to do something different with the Escape from Prison theme and mixes it up with science fiction and post-apocalyptic production design. The action is well staged and shot. This has Martin Campbell behind the camera, one of the best directors when it comes to Bond films for example. He knows how to tell a story, plus he knows how to shoot and stage epic explosions. This and the Mask of Zorro have some of the finest explosive finales. It's definitely a forgotten gem from the 90s. There could have been a number of contributing factors to its failure at the box office, such as stiff competition, it didn't attract the action fans as it didn't have an action star in the lead, maybe if Jean-Claude Van Damme did take the part it would have done well and had more of a mass market appeal, or perhaps the advertising at the time just didn't target the right audience. But certainly seek it out if you can find the Blu-ray or perhaps stream it on Netflix or Amazon if it's available, as it's a great Saturday night movie and I'm sure you won't be disappointed. Father fell ill soon after you left. The men are worried. They should be. Merrick's gonna attack. We're outnumbered six to one. Merrick's united all the gangs, so if he wants this place, there's nothing we can do to stop him. If we stay here, he's gonna kill us all. What are you saying? Abandon the village? No, no, I think what he's saying is that we should just walk away from everything we've worked for for the last 13 years. That's bullshit! I'm not walking away without a fight. He's right. What is the point of fooling ourselves? We've always been about survival. Whatever it takes. I've been here for 13 years. From the beginning, I have built this place with my sweat, my heart, and I've watched a lot of good men die defending it. And I saw for the first time in my whole miserable life what a home could be. I can't just walk out on it. I can't just hand it over to those animals because nobody's going to be here to stop them. You said no one's going to be here. I hope you enjoyed the video, be sure to subscribe to see more retrospectives and commentaries. Also click on the bell to be notified of the latest reviews. If you want access to exclusive videos and to watch my content a few days before it's on YouTube, you can head on over to my Patreon. Thank you very much.